Hey there, welcome to our football show. I'm Chris Pugh. Got the great Pierre Holland Jr. from the Canton Repository with us tonight. Uh, Pierre, how are you? I'm doing all right. How you doing, Chris? Good. I promise I won't fall asleep on you this week. I, uh, <laughs> last week, uh, we were doing this very late, and we're changing the time. Hopefully, this old man here, uh, blocking me, can stay awake for this, but... It's early, Peter. If I fall asleep now, feel free to turn me into the doctor or something because yeah, I shouldn't be falling asleep this early at night, right? Hey, man. All that matters is we got through it. I think that's all that matters. We got through it. Yeah. Well, if I didn't pull the ripcord, I would have been laying on the table. It could have gotten pretty bad pretty soon. All right. Well, hey, uh, we got a shorter time this week, which is good. Uh, let's talk some football. Uh, let's start out with the Buckeyes, who we usually start out with. I don't know, Peter. I hate to say it. I mean, Buck has won, what was a 49 to 10? I mean, that's good. <laughs> There's nothing against that. It just seemed a little blah for the most part. Uh, they played Rutgers. Rutgers kind of ran the clock out a lot. Uh, they played the defense that kind of took away a lot of the long uh, passes from C.J. Stroud. Uh, Buckeyes didn't have Travion Henderson and Smith and Jimna. Um, so, I don't know. I mean... I don't think it was a disappointing performance. I, I just felt blah after watching that. What was your take on how Ohio State did? Um, I'll be honest with you. I didn't really see that game because I was, like, really bouncing, like, other um, college football game that was going on. But yeah, I, I, I have been keeping track. And, yeah, I did saw that, um, yeah, the, that, um, the final score didn't really tell the story. Of uh, that Rucker against Rutgers, uh, CJ Stroud didn't really play too well. Uh, not, not that we would have hoped, but, uh, obviously, uh, 13 for 20, 254 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. Um, they were without uh, Travion Williams, that you mentioned, but I think what really got them going was obviously on um, Mayan Williams. At least we saw an emerging of that, that guy. Um, yeah. Having a big game with 100. 189 yards and five touchdowns. So yeah. even without even without Trayvon Williams, they were, were able to run the football fluently, and I was, that got them through the game. So it, they did, offense was really not up the up the part. And yeah, without Trayvon and um, Jackson Jigba, they were still playing and still good enough to put on 49 points on the Rutgers team, which you would expect. Yeah, and I think the other way of looking at it was it wasn't the most thrilling game. But then on the other hand, look at what they did with Fah Henderson and Jimba, where maybe at this time last year, if you took those guys away, maybe that takes away from your offense. But, you know, you know, like you said, Mayan Williams played really well. And, you know, it, shows, it seems like it's a deeper team this year than last year, which will definitely help come playoff time, I imagine. Yeah, it's good to have death and good to see some uh... – some guys that you might not be too familiar with or see guys step in when your starters has been out. So, like, Travion being out, you got Mayan Williams, and Jigba has been stepping um, Jigba has been out, and you have um, Yuka. That, I think that's how you pronounce yeah. it. Yuka, who's been their leading receivers these last few weeks. So, it's good to have – Death all around who can just step in and they're incredibly young for the game the experience as well. So at least with Ohio State, that once they get everyone back and healthy, uh, Ohio State will get a good team to roll. Yeah, and think about this way too. If, if these guys get healthy near the end of the year, they got rest. It's not like they're playing a full season. I mean, you know, you know maybe you get 100% Travion, uh, 100% Najimba, and who knows? Maybe it's a blessing in disguise, you know? And, <laughs> and again, hey, Buckeyes won by 39 without a couple of the top guys. So, yeah, it was the most exciting thing in the world. But on the other hand, hey, good for the Buckeyes. They got the win. win. That's all that matters. Right. For Buckeyes, for, um, I'm sure Buckeye Nation will say a win's a win, no matter how poorly they played. I was about ready to turn it off at the end because, you know, hey, it was a blowout. It was kind of crazy. But, my goodness, we almost had a coach fight. Um, the Buckeyes at the end of the game, their punter, uh, he kind of rolls out when he punts, and when he rolled out, nobody was near him. So he just said, screw it, I'm going to start running. 
he got about a 30 yard gain um and he got hit uh out of bounds was a late hit from Rutgers. Ohio State kind of came around the Rutgers guy. It got pretty ugly for a while. And Greg Shiano, the coach of Rutgers, ran across the field, got in the Ryan uh, Day's face, did job back and forth. Um, coaches didn't fight, which they, I guess was okay. And after the game, they kind of you know brushed it off, said, "Hey, it's it's all good. We just got in the heat of the moment." Man, it could have been great here. I mean, we missed a real big story. Yeah, that was that was kind of interesting there. Uh, Greg Schiano versus Ryan Day. I'll, I'll ask you this, Chris: yeah. If those two were in a ring together, who do you think will win a, win that fight? Um, Ryan Day's younger. Maybe Ryan Day is probably a little bit better shaped than Schiano. But man, Schiano seems like a tough guy. Kind of like that old dude, like. Yeah, you know, old military veteran or something that's going to get you or something. I don't know. Maybe Shiano? One thing, I know for sure Greg Shiano won't back down to anyone, and especially oh, yeah. um, especially that uh, I, what was his mindset um, early in his coaching career is chop chop wood or something like that or keep yeah. on chopping. That was, that was like their mindset there. So Rucker, Rucker was tough back then when he was – when he was coaching, so I won't hold that against him. I mean, he's up in age now, but hey, he probably might have some some little um problems in him if if um, someone challenged him. And you know, Rutgers clearly was not matched by Ohio State. I I think with some of their tactics, they did good to keep it within thirty nine points by you know running down the play clock on virtually every play and everything. But to Shannon's credit. He was tough. He was screaming at the guys. I mean, he was trying to give them a play harder. I mean, I would, man, Pierre, if it was me and I was coaching against Ohio State and I had an inferior team, he, he, I'd probably get bored after a while. But, you know, at least the Shannon's credit. He played tough, and his guys played tough for him. It, it was just clearly outmatched. I mean, Ohio State's mm-hmm. eons better this year. So. Right, right, right. Well, we got a couple of things to talk about. Like I said, a little bit limited time today. Uh, let's talk about the Browns. Kind of interesting. Um, you know, Miles Garrett had that awful um, car wreck. Uh, thankfully, he's okay. Uh, but it looked like the Browns kind of felt it. Um, you know, they were without him. They were without J.V. and Clowney. And, you know, yeah, I mean, they're a better team than the Falcons going into the game. But, you know, NFL teams, it's, you know, nobody in the NFL is really like Rutgers. Yeah, you know, any given Sunday, you know, things could happen. It happened. Falcons over the Browns. Um, did it surprise you that much with the injuries on the Browns? What do you think happened there? Uh, well, first of all, I actually did kind of call it that. I did say that, yeah, the Browns look better but on paper, but do not sleep on this Falcons team. I did definitely said that on the last episode. The Falcons guys, they're, they might not be a playoff team, but – they're going to ruin someone else's playoff contention for sure. They got guys, and they kind of showed it. They literally won the game with Marcus Mariota completing seven passes. Yeah. Let that sink in. Like, come on now. Like, they ran the football well. I think that's what kind of stand out with the Falcons, why they won, is that they ran the football well. They really took advantage of Cleveland Browns missing all their de- defensive linemen, um, just getting to the next level. Of uh, just running down their throats and without having missing all their defensive guys, so that kind of took a toll on them on the offensive end. Uh, and where's Amari Cooper? I guess that's probably the best thing I could say. Yeah, that. what was he? One catch for nine yards. He even make he even make the Atlanta trip. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to him. He got he got he got trapped in Terrell Island. AJ yeah. Terrell Island balled out against him. He went one on one against him, and he was on him like flies to garbage. Uh, so that was probably a probably the low key key of the game. If they they could make they were able to run the football with Nick Chubb, and still not enough, but they were not able to get enough from their passing, and they were depending a lot on Amari Cooper take him out, then all you have to do is just stop, able to stop the run long enough where 
where they could just get through the win. And I think that's what exactly what happened. And some you could just probably say is the you could probably say is the play calling has always been an issue with what's going on with um Cleveland with not running the ball when the only thing that's moving your offense is Nick Chubb and you still trying to open up the pass with just with um Jacoby Brissett. Knowing that Jacoby Brissett is not going to be what you want him to be, he's going to be inconsistent. That's why he is who he is. He'll give you some good games and he'll give you some bad games. That's just who he is. He's up and down. That's so depending too much on Jacoby Brissett instead of the one that continued to work for you and you still haven't utilized them to his potential is Nick Chubb and you're running your game. And if they can't get grips to that, then you're going to see some more losses on the Cleveland Browns. Well, yeah, I look back at that Browns win of the Steelers. Percent looked well. And I think part of the reason why it looked well was Chubb set him up. When you've got a guy like Nick Chubb running like he did, and, and Chubb had a really good game against the Steelers, yeah, that's going to make Percent look good. I mean, Percent had a really good game against the Steelers. They just didn't seem to get that going against the Falcons. And, you know, and, you know, we're talking mostly ESC North here, but I'll let me mention some of my team is Steelers. You've got to score points to win today's NFL. And, you know, what did the Browns score, 20 points? That's not always going to win. I mean, the, the defense isn't what it used to be with a lot of NFL teams, and, and you got to score. I mean, it's the thing with the Steelers. They benched their quarterback, Mitch Trubisky. I don't know if Kane Pickett's the answer or not, but Mitch Trubisky is throwing up like 10, 12, 14 points a game. That's not going to win you any games in the NFL. You, you got to score. And I know where the Browns are going through. I know they're waiting for Deshaun Watson to come back. I mean, I know they're a little hamstrung right now with that. But you still got to score points. And, and, you know, Peter, you're right, man. Get that running game going. Then you got percent looking good. I mean, you can score points even with the personnel you have right now. Right, right. I mean, going back to your Steelers logic, I mean, is that really the only issue with them? I mean, yeah, offensively. Oh, they're, they're a poor football team right now. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're pretty bad right now on all cylinders. Um, the quarterback situation with uh, Kenny Pickett, maybe he might create a spark. I mean, he did show some potential there that he could win you a football game if you put him in the right, right situation. But the offensive line is still poor. Your defense, I didn't even realize T.J. Watt was a – I know T.J. Watt is an elite player, but you haven't won a game since T.J. Watt went down. I don't know if y'all. I don't know if you noticed that stat. But, um, so, yeah, the Steelers are pretty down right now, and it's going to continue to get worse now that your defense is banged up. Well, and I'm trying to look up this record because it's insane. I'm. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, this is as of September 25th, so. You got another loss to it. But since 2017, get this, Peter. Steelers are 52, 24, and 2 with TJ Watt. So, I mean, they've won games. Record without Watt, 0 and 7. With there Watt it to is. Give, that was I was looking for. Yeah. With Watt to give up 20 points a game, without him to get to give up 26. And again, that was before last game. Uh, with Watt, three and a half sacks. Without Watt, one point seven sacks. So, um, yeah, and you know, tell you, Peters, they got uh, the Bills next. <laughs> they got the Buccaneers next. Then they play the Dolphins and they play the Eagles. I mean, they could play a lot better, and you still lose four games. I mean, those are gonna be hard games to win. And those are four of your better teams in the NFL right now, which just is crazy. So, yeah, later yeah, tonight. Oh, the AFC North, I was about to say the AFC North Division. They're they're having it hard themselves. It's not just it's not even just the Steelers, man. We can go back with the Browns. They got the Chargers. They got the Patriots. They got the Ravens. Oh, yeah. They got the Bills. The AFC North. We were hoping that they were going to be like the one of those superior competitive divisions, and it's just completely going backwards with them and it looked like that it's just the only thing positive going with them is the Cincinnati Bengals. Well here's the issue of both the Browns and the Steelers. You look at their schedules over the first four games 
if they were going to be a playoff team, and you know, Peter, we talked about this with the Browns. You know, what would the Browns' record need to be when Deshaun Watson comes back for them to have a chance? And I think, like with the Browns, you were telling me like what seven and four or six and five, at very worst, you can't lose games like that. I mean, to be seven and four when Deshaun comes back, you've got to beat the Atlanta Falcons. And not, and you're right, the, the Falcons are a pesky team. They're going to get you if you're not careful. But you're not a playoff team if you don't beat the Falcons. Like the Steelers are a playoff team if they don't beat the Jets. I mean, these are games you have to win to say, hey, maybe they can make the playoffs later. And, and they, you know, they just didn't do it. And, and, I mean, on the Sewers end, play Kane Pickett and see what you got. If he completely falls on his face and the Sewers are like 2-15 and 15 or whatever, now you can go pick C.J. Stroud or Bryce in the draft. You, you know, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at for the Sewers right now. And, you know, T.J. White, he's supposedly going to be ready to play in a couple weeks. Hey, if we're 1-7, Rest TJ. <laughs> TJ doesn't need to uh, risk injury for one seventeen. Okay? So, I it's a bummer, Peter, but I think I feel better about it when I realize, hey, they're not a good team this year. You know, I mean, that's wouldn't pretty it, much. Would it be the first losing season under Mike Tomlin? Yeah, it's kind of funny because I think a lot of those guys, maybe even Tomlin himself, freak out about it, and I think that's why they kind of kept uh, Trubisky in for as long as they did. But I'm sitting here, I'm like, you know, the Browns um, media would always say this before this year. We need to find the franchise quarterback. That's where the Steelers are at right now. It's clear that Mitch Trubisky is not the guy. I don't even know if Kenny Pickett's the guy. But right now as they approach that, and and you're right, there's a lot more problems than just a quarterback in Pittsburgh. You got to find that guy. You got to play Pickett, see what happens. I, I think you give him a spark. I'm not sure if he's the quarterback, but I mean, Trubisky was kind of afraid to throw it downfield. At least Pickett's more of a gunslinger. We'll see what happens. Who knows? Um, I, I want to definitely talk about this. Um, well, first of all, let's mention this real quick. This is AFC North related. The Ravens kind of had a wild loss over the weekend. They lost to the Bills. The Bills are a really good team, but man, they were up by a lot. Looks like the Ravens had the game in the bag and the Bills came back, and I think part of it is the Bills are a really good team. But, man, what what should take on the Ravens? I mean, why couldn't they close this game out? Probably want to start with the coach. You can start with yeah. Harbaugh. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I just still can't get over why you wouldn't just go for the points instead of going for it all. I mean – Literally, it came down by you just got to get him the field goal and just get him to stop and you could have won. That was kind of what I was on. And Harbaugh's going to have to eat with that. You know? I'm sure a lot of his players felt that way. I know Mark Peters definitely felt yeah. that way. Uh, it's just those things that you just can't not – that's just one of those questionable things about with the Ravens right now. They are a legitimate team. They are a good team, especially with Lamar Jackson, who we ain't going to – I mean, we also got to hit Lamar Jackson some accountability as well for some of his questionable decision-making. But at the same time, you could – for Harbaugh, you continue to put themselves in a situation where you could have just gone for the points instead of just forcing them to go for the end, go for the touchdown, which is bold. And I'm sure nobody won't talk about it if they actually execute it. But – at the end of the day, when you're going against a superior Buffalo Bills team, you really cannot afford any kind of mistakes. And that's what happened with the Buffalo Bills, and I thought they would learn from that after that Miami Dolphins game when you allow five touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And right. yet, look where we are now with the Baltimore Ravens. So that's going to be the Achilles heels with them. Is not Lamar Jackson and what he can do. He's going to do what he do best, but are you going to continue with these with these conservative play calling? It's just been an issue with the Baltimore Ravens all this time, and it's definitely going to hurt them if they don't get that right. Well, I think part of the problem with the Ravens, you got to figure out what you're doing with Lamar Jackson. I, I know Lamar Jackson wants a ton of money. I understand that. And I understand what happens when you give a quarterback a lot of money. It, it impacts the rest of your team, just in the amount of salary caps that you have 
to spend on other guys. And I know that Lamar Jackson hasn't been the top, top, top quarterback in the NFL. But, you know, right now, Pierre, man, quarterbacks are demanding and getting a lot of money. I mean, look at Deshaun Watson. Look at, I mean, it sets the market, and you're going to have to pay your Lamar Jacksons, your Joe Burrows, a lot of money. And I got I got to think, I don't think there's a lot of dissension right now, but right now Lamar doesn't have a contract. You don't know if the Ravens want to keep him or not. Do they franchise him next year? They got to figure that stuff out. They're not going to franchise him. And he's not going to take the franchise either, which he should rightfully so. Right. But I guess what I'm saying is I I think it just hurts that room, even if it's not being talked about. Doesn't it help when you say, hey, this is our quarterback. We like, we trust him. He's a guy moving forward. And I can see the issues with giving him a ton of guaranteed money. But what else do you have here? I mean, you can't, you know, I mean, it's not guaranteed you're going to find that guy in the draft. Are they going to get another guy in free agency? Look, the Steelers, I know Big Ben wasn't the same guy as he was. But once you lost Big Ben, you're back to square one. You're one and three, you know. I mean, I mean, what would you do if you're the Ravens? I mean. I'm not saying you have to give Lamar the money, but where are your other options at right now? You, you know, there really isn't any options like that right now. They they did gave him an offer, and he turned yeah. it down. There's really I don't know what else they could have done at that. They thought that this was a reasonable deal, and he will still be one of the highest paid quarterbacks. Uh, but that's not what Lamar wants. I think the only solution is if you really believe, if you really believe Lamar Jackson as your franchise quarterback and you want him longevity, then you might as well just hand him a blank check. And he, that's that's the, probably the only solution there. It's not like Lamar has an agent to negotiate with. It's literally him in the front office. So right. it's, it's he's betting on himself, and he's continuing to prove that you that. I am your franchise quarterback. Look at all the numbers. Look what I've done already. And I'm likely going to be MVP this year. And you're and I'm going to walk away. And for someone who can't afford me and look at yeah. my own terms. That's what Lamar Jackson's on right now. So it's gonna okay. it's gonna be a bad, it'll be a complete blowback on the Baltimore Ravens, but it but in Baltimore Ravens defense, how else were they gonna handle this? Yeah. I, I mean, right now, Mitch Trubisky could be a Raven next year if they get rid of Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't think Lamar Jackson is the greatest quarterback of all time. But, again, like we're saying, okay, who's your alternative right now? You, you know, I mean, you don't want Tyler Mitch Hundley. Trubisky or – Tyler Huntley. He, he looked pretty good when he's on the field, so maybe they might give him a chance. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, he would be, be a lot cheaper. I mean, I, he's – He's yeah, no different I, than Lamar. I I heard some talk at the end of last year, and Steelers Twitter is insane. They everybody is free. They think they can just get them. <laughs> you know, they don't understand the whole trading thing. But you know, a lot of people said, "Man, if the Steelers need a quarterback, maybe talk, you know Huntley could be a quarterback for Steelers." Yeah, he was he was interesting. He kept the Ravens in games. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I know the Ravens lost a, a lot of games in a row, but man, Huntley kept them in games. The Ravens never got killed at the end last year. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Hey, I I've got like two minutes left. I hate to. I know you're passionate about the Dolphins and everything. How do we take care of the situation with the Dolphins? And I, I should give you more than two minutes to talk about this. But what's your quick way? I I mean, I I really think the NFL needs a impartial concussion guy to look at these guys and say, hey, you're good or you're bad. Because I don't know what the Dolphins should have done. You know, yeah, they want to try to win the game. I, I mean, unless they think two is dying. The issue, the issue is the protocol itself. That's, yeah. that's what it is. There's, I don't know what was the Miami Dolphins was supposed to do. And uh, they did have a neurologist on site. that They always do. Um, but I don't know. There was if if two didn't get injured in that Cincinnati Bengals game, we would not have this discussion right now. Because right now, just trying to bring it up, and now they're looking for a fall guy because it's bad because of the PR. That's just what yeah. it is. Now the Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, 
They're, he's in protocol right now, um, and we'll see what happens. But right now, the issue is the NFL protocol itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I just get yeah, a non-partial guy, guy from the NFL, and just he can make that call. He can say, man, this guy's not looking good. He's got to sit for the game. And then on the other hand, you don't want let defenders say, okay, you know, if a defender makes a horrible hit to give a guy a concussion, maybe the defender goes out of the game too. Almost like the college targeting rule. Now, I know the college targeting rule gets a little crazy at times, but you got to protect these players. And I don't think it's on the coach to do that. You, you have to have somebody impartial because what's the coach going to do? Oh, he might have a concussion. We got to keep on the game. No, the coach wants to win. And I think, if you, like you said, the protocol screwed up. If you have a guy that can make that determination, I think the NFL will be a much better place. That's something and, that they're going to have to address in a collective bargaining agreement. Thank yeah. You. Well, and we've heard over the past couple of years, all these great athletes dying with CT issues like Junior Seau and all these other guys that, you know, just, I mean, as a big fan of football history, I'm like, these guys are gone, you know, because of CT issues. Uh, my first Hall of Fame I ever covered was Mike Webster being inducted. And Mike Webster couldn't put two words together because of the CT issues. I don't know, man. It's tough. Well, Peter, thanks so much for your time. I uh, had some <laughs> issues with our car we had to take care of, so we kind of move things around. Uh, next week, we'll have more of a longer show, and we can talk about the crazy world of football. Um, uh, real quick, who's Mansfield play this week? Who's West playing? Maslin. Sorry, I said Mansfield. I meant Maslin. Mans. Uh, now you got me saying Mansfield. Yeah. Maslin. is playing a uh, team in Buffalo, New York. Can they shit? Uh, no. Um, can C is? I think that's how you pronounce it. Is um, it in Maslin? Yeah, it's, it's at Maslin. That's what they okay. play. So they're on a six game streak, and it's like going to go to seven. All right. Well, check out Piers' coverage. Canton Repository, Mass Independent, Alliance Review, whatever Star County paper you prefer. Uh, Peter, Peter's going to be there covering Mass for you. All right, Peter. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great day. Hang out a second. And thanks for checking out our podcast. Have a good one. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mooney. Welcome to what is our new Hope Interrupted podcast based on the work from our book, Hope Interrupted, that I co authored with my good friend Byron McCauley. Hey, Jennifer, you know, I'm looking forward to this podcast as much as I was look, looking forward to writing this book with you. We hope to interview some uh, high impact folks as well as have a little fun. We're going to cover stories of hope. To learn more about our podcast and our book, please visit www.hopeinterrupted.com.